Hello, and welcome to The Right Side. The Right Side is a news talk show produced by the Taunton Republican City Committee. We strive to present local, state, and national issues that impact our community. And we welcome all points of view to foster greater understanding and awareness. We want to make it clear that the views and opinions expressed on The Right Side do not reflect the view of Taunton Cable Media Access. And now, with great pleasure, we welcome you to The Right Side for a discussion of the issues of the day. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to The Right Side. We're a conservative talk show put on by the Taunton RCC, that's Republican City Committee. My name is David Steinoff and I'll be your host. Actually, if you'd like to watch us, like us on, and like us on Facebook, hit facebook.com slash the right side TV. Follow us on Twitter at right side TV, the right side TV. And please visit our website at www.tauntonrcc.com. Ladies and gentlemen, our guest tonight, none other than Representative Shauna O'Connell from Taunton. It's Bristol 3rd, which goes all the way up to Easton. That's right, one precinct in Easton, precinct 6. Uh, all of Taunton and? Most of Taunton. Okay. Most of Taunton and one precinct in Easton. Well, thank you very much for coming on tonight. Um, just a brief background. You've been a rep for? I was first elected in 2010. Okay. So I was just re-elected last November, very uh, humbled and honored to be re-elected. Now, the first term, was that a full term? Oh, yes. Okay. And f second, went well, you won by an even bigger margin, am I right, this time? Yes, very large. I was uh, very honored to have so much support here in Taunton. And Taunton's, Taunton is not all Republican by, by a long stretch. Oh, it's, it's very, you know, a very democratic, blue-collar kind of city. Um, I've lived here all my life. I love my hometown of Taunton. And, uh, you know, I couldn't be more proud to be the state representative here. Absolutely. And we, I, we couldn't be more proud to have you here. Then, before you became a rep, you were mom, full-time mom, and had yeah. your own full-time job. Right. I worked, um, I worked actually kind of part-time uh, to full-time as a court reporter for 15 years, a freelance reporter. And I got involved in politics because in 2008, I got involved in trying to help get Jessica's law passed here in Massachusetts, That's kind of, which is mandatory sentencing for sex offenders. That's what kind of brought me into the political arena. That's what led to this? I mean, that's yeah, the really, impetus just, that pushed. Yeah, being a mom, wanting to protect my kids, wanting tough laws, and that's how I got involved. And it wasn't easy at first. No, no. It's, I mean, you, you jumped right into the whole campaign trail, got out there, shook hands, did everything you were supposed yeah. to, and from what I understand, burned down a lot of shoe leather to get there. Yes, we did. I mean, it was a grassroots effort. We had a small team, you know, helping out. Nobody ever thought we would win. And, you know, we just worked really, really hard, met people connected, and um, had a good message, and they believed in us. And uh, so I was, you know, reelected, or elected the first time, rather. And, and, and pulled through even better the second time. And just to plug the fellows, the, the group that puts this show together, the Taunton Republican City Committee had a, had a hand in helping you out. Yes. They've been very helpful and very... They have been. And, you know, these were guys, you know, Gene McCaffrey, I met him by knocking on his door. You know, he was an independent kind of guy. He liked what I had to say, and that's how we met. And then he started working on my campaign. So it was really grassroots uh, people that, that helped me out. And then during my re-election, we had all the same people, plus Pete Mazzone, um, Stel Borges was You mean our very own Pete Mazzone? Yes. Pete yeah. Mazzone. All right. Well, good. Now, the job state rep so that people who are watching tonight can understand a little bit more about it. So I think some people believe it to be a part-time job. It's not at all. No, you know, it is uh, more than a full-time job. It's a lot of work, and I, I really enjoy it. I really appreciate it, but it, it definitely is a lot of work. It's what you put into it, I guess. You know, there are reps who have other jobs and work as reps. I'm, I'm not sure how one can do that, but uh, people do it, and that's fine. You, you have the right to do that. I personally feel like I really have to focus all my attention on this district, on Taunton, and on the people that elected me to office. And, and we're going to be breaking in just a moment, Shona, to um, Pete on the Street. It's a small segment we have where we get to hear from some of the folks in Taunton. Pete, our very own Pete Mazzone, goes out and solicits information. So in just a few seconds, we'll bring that up. He's got a nice yeah. little segment talking to somebody who oh, asked, 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 had a few comments about Sean O'Connell, and we're hopefully going to be able to find out from people what they actually think. Some people, uh, there are a lot of people right now who don't know what you're doing. That's what we're going to try to let them okay, understand. Can. All right, and in just a few seconds, we'll have that up. Now, well, I'm interested to see yeah, it. <laughs> I, I can't wait. Two, one, there we go. Thank you. 
Good morning. Do you have a few minutes? Sure, sure. All right. And you know, I love the smell of a lumberyard in the morning. Warren, uh, do you feel there's any fraud in the welfare system in the Commonwealth today? Absolutely. I think it's a broken system that needs to be repaired. Do you think it's fair to raise taxes on hardworking people while the state possibly turns a blind eye to fraud and abuse? Not at all. I actually, I, I wish they would straighten things out a little bit because I feel like I work and support too many people. Uh, do you think it's? Uh, do you think that people should give their social security number in order to get benefits? Absolutely, I have to in order to work. Why don't they in order to collect? Now, are you are you familiar with Rep Representative Shauna O'Connell at all? I am. I, I am. I think she's doing a great job. Uh, is, is there uh, is there any one particular item that she's fighting for that, that's caught your eye that's uh, come to your attention? Uh, she works with small businesses and set up a small business agency that seems to help, and she's working on EBT reform, which is a real giant step in the right direction. It seems to be the first one to really address it. Regarding child protection, uh, Shauna O'Connell's been working for uh, protecting children. Do you think that tougher laws are needed to protect children from predators? Absolutely. Um, children are relatively innocent, and there's a lot of predators they seem to keep letting back out on the streets. Uh, what, what would you suggest be a penalty for the rape of a child? I don't think I'll answer that, because I think it may be a little too severe. And do you think there should be mandatory sentences for, for convicted child sex abusers? Yes, because sex abuse is something that, in my understanding, can't be corrected and they shouldn't be let back out on the street to do it again. Do, do you think that parents uh, should have access to all information regarding registered sex offenders? If I had children, I'd want to be able to defend them, so yes, I guess the answer would be yes. All right. I guess we're back on. That was a nice little segment. I want to thank yeah, Pete was. Mazzone, too, because he goes out there and works hard. And even though it lasts just a couple minutes, people may not appreciate the fact that Pete, Jack, they spend hours editing some of these tapes and going out and soliciting these questions. We have to thank Mr. Biss, or Warren Biss, for taking time to answer a few. Uh, he That's brought up right. the question about EBT. Now, everybody knows Representative Shauna O'Connell, synonymous with EBT reform. Could you just go on and explain a little bit about what some of the key factors are affecting them. Sure, sure. I mean, I think everybody does know that. I've been working on this since day one, and we have gotten some reforms done, some put in place. We need to go a lot further with reforms. I think a couple of the, the biggest problems in our, in our you know, public assistance programs are the fact that um, we don't require Social Security numbers for people to begin getting assistance. And how can you identify someone? How can you verify their employment, their um, residency, mm -hmm. the things that they need to qualify if you don't have their Social Security number? So legislation that I have filed says, you know, you, requires a Social Security number to before you begin getting assistance. And the other thing that uh, happens is these what, what they call self-declarations. Mm -hmm. So that means you come into the welfare office, you apply for welfare, and you just say, you know, I, um, I sleep on my uncle's couch, I pay him 800 bucks a month for rent, and I sign a piece of paper, cross my heart and hope to die, and that's your verification. That's it. That's all the person would have to do to, to be given some type of assistance. Right. So, so those are some of the things. They wouldn't check that. And you know that happens with a lot of different things. It's not just rent. And people are just allowed to sign their name to a piece of paper, and nothing is verified. So I've also filed legislation to um, set up a system whereby there's verification before you get a dime of taxpayer money. We verify all your information. We find out who you are and that you actually do apply. Because we want to help people who need help. We don't want people in right. the system fraudulently. You're not interested in taking anyone's safety net of the people right. who need it. And I have, I have seniors who tell me that they've had tough times. We want the safety net for them. You're not interested in taking it away from people who are handicapped or disabled, but you want the funds to be there for them. That's right. And, you know, we had the inspector general did an audit on the Department of Transitional Assistance, and it came back with some really stunning information, a minimum of $25 million in um, fraudulently obtained benefits. That's a large amount of money. 25 and, for one year? Yeah, and that's the minimum that you know he came up with. So you know that is a lot of money that we could be spending elsewhere. And you know what I, I think about when I think about that fraud is the governor is closing Taunton State Hospital. 
Mm -hmm. And here we have all this fraud in our public assistance programs, millions and millions and millions of dollars that could be keeping Taunton State Hospital open because we need those services here in southeastern Massachusetts. So, you know, I think, you know, fighting for reform in our welfare system is just key to being able to afford, you know, some of the programs that are so important to people, police, fire, safety. You know, we could have a whole new fleet of cruisers if we got rid of half the fraud in our public assistance programs. Uh, the 25 million you talked about is just one sector, just one segment of the yeah. whole picture. Assistance is mass health, EBT, uh, food assistance stamps. for living, right? Yeah, uh, food stamps. You know, the food stamp program is, is um, much, much larger than the cash assistance program. And, you know, in the past year and a half, we have had five um, drug busts in that program with people trafficking cards and selling them for money or drugs. Five. And, you know, that is hundreds of millions of dollars that, that we're talking in that program as well. And we, we know that... Hundreds of millions. Yeah. You know, in, in all the programs combined, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and well, there's no telling. I mean, we would have to go well, ferret out all the fraud before we could really pin that number down. That's but. right. We do. And, and I believe it is an astronomical number. And it's always a lot more than you think it is. I think once we tear apart these programs and really fix them, we're going to be stunned at all of the fraud in the programs. And, you know, we, we have plenty of examples, and they're not anecdotal. They're not leakage, as we've heard from our governor. They are real, leakage. real problems. Um, some of the leakage was $27 million paid out to people who did not qualify for food stamps. 27, 27 million. million in one year. Um, well, that wasn't even a year, but uh, and then we had to pay that back to the federal government, and you know, to add insult to injury, we had to pay three million dollars in overtime to fix all the mistakes that were made. So, you know, these are things. And the that, governor called it leakage. Well, yes, he says that we have so, you know, leakage. I'm just wondering program. how I would uh, look at my secretary next week if she told me that the uh, the office lost ten thousand dollars this week and it was just leakage. Right. You know. Yeah. Um, but I can't imagine any CEO keeping his job, but not to pick on the governor. 27 million in that short period of time, and I, I know you touched on it before. I remember reading about a store owner who was nabbed during the sting operation. Yeah. He was turning EBT cards. Sometimes he would keep 50% of the of the ticket money. Yeah, that's what they usually do. Yeah. And and for that cut, he would actually turn cash back over to the individual. Right. So you know, you sell your card. There's 200 dollars on it in food stamps. You sell it. You, you know, the store owner keeps 100. He gives you 100. And in some cases, there was a drug dealer right there to sell you drugs. Not everyone was buying drugs with it. Some people were getting the money for I don't know what reasons. Um, you know, uh, there was one Fox store. Woods or yeah. uh, cigarettes, whatever the case is. You know, clearly there's, there's abuses and fraud in the program. And oh, the other thing is we found a receipt from someone. When you use your EBT card, the clerk in the store gets a receipt that says your balance of your food stamps mm -hmm. and your cash. Um, a, a store clerk turned in a receipt to us with a $7,000 balance on their food stamp card. $7,000. You mean and it just kept building up? It just kept building up. Uh, a heck of a savings account, right? That's right, and, and, and that's the whole point. These aren't savings accounts. Right. These aren't ATM this cards. This is meant to be and there that's what to help people into. give them a hand up. We're still trying to get an answer on how that can happen and how many other balances we have like that in this state. We've been unable to get that answer so far. Information from the, not really from the really Department available. of Transitional Assistance. It's, it's not forthcoming. Now, EBT is just one of the things you're trying to clean up. And right. we're also checking into um, scholarships or uh, in-state tuition. Oh, in-state tuition. Yeah, for illegal aliens. Right. And is Massachusetts dealing with that right now? I know, as far as I know, Rhode Island has made it legal so that even though you may be an illegal alien, the children can go right to the uh, Rhode Island State Colleges for the in-state tuition. And if I wanted to send my child, being that I'm a mass resident, I, we'd have to pay full tuition. Right. And so in, I believe, 2006, the legislature voted, legislature voted that we would not provide in-state tuition rates to illegal aliens. The governor has overridden that and has started providing that assistance. And, you know, you've got pe we've got people in border states. Their parents work here. They pay taxes here. Yet they don't get that kind of assistance. We've got hardworking folks who have their kids, you know, who live and have grown up in Massachusetts. They don't get assistance. They, they work two jobs to put their kids through college. This is costing us money. And we're going we're gonna to have lawsuits from this because of the issue of out-of-state uh, our border state. The situation going on. And, and if I'm not mistaken, 
the uh, Marathon bombers, that youngest one that's been captured, he was receiving assistance even though his student visa had expired. Yes, um, the, the terrorists received a lot of assistance from uh, Massachusetts taxpayers. And we're still trying to find out the answers to exactly what kind of assistance they were receiving and how they, how they qualified, were they eligible. And yes, one of them that went to UMass Dartmouth got assistance. My understanding right now is that um, the federal government has said that we cannot get that information. Now, had they been, um, had he been uh, classified as, um, a, you know, a, a terrorist, um, uh, a combatant, enemy combatant, we would be able to get that information. But they, he was not charged as an enemy combatant, and so now we do not have access to that. Because of semantics, we're not going to be able to right. get this well, information. Well, you know, that was the federal government's call not to charge him as an enemy combatant. Any idea as to why they would pull that cord or? or, or hold it that way. It's just the, this yeah. administration's I think trend. it's an agenda. You know, mm -hmm. it's an agenda. Well, we're we've got lots of subject matter to touch on. We could use hours to pull all of this out of you, Representative O'Connell. But uh, so shortly, we're going to be taking another break to Pete on the street, and we'll talk about mandatory sentencing, which is something I know you just had session and brought, brought some of that legislature to the floor. Am I correct? Well, we had a hearing, and so I testified in the hearing. Okay, so that's the start. Yeah, right. That's the first step in the process where well, your bills get a hearing. Especially given this recent case, the kidnapping. I mean, I think it all ties in, and we'd like to hear a lot more about that, get a little education on what's going on in the state. I can't imagine anybody right now after hearing that Burbine incident, the, uh, the uh, daycare center. Right. What was he charged with, 13 counts of, of well, molestation? 13, I think, and, you know, 13 victims, 100 counts. Yeah, it's it was awful. Just awful. I and you're going to explain to us how the different steps and levels are treated. Yeah, sure. Mind. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. All right. Well, we're still so. going and are we ready? We're not ready for uh, Pete on the street yet. Good. They'll give us the warning yeah. when it's time. All In right. that case, go ahead and just expand on that if you wouldn't mind. The mandatory okay. sentencing, some of the different levels yeah. So, so legislation that I have filed um, deals with, you know, keeping our kids safe. I think the two most important things we can do to keep children safe, and we can do them, you know, efficiently and effectively, and implement them very quickly, is um, long mandatory sentences and giving parents all the information they need, which means posting levels one, two, and three sex offenders online. Uh, now, you know, the mandatory sentences. Right now, we do not have a mandatory sentence for the first time conviction of rape of a child. So I have filed legislation that says once your first conviction, rape of a child, 12 and under, it's very important, 12 and under, I mean, This does break it years. away. I, some people bring up the question of, of statutory rape yes. with the 18-year-old.